afternoon. Good afternoon and welcome to SAR's 2021 Mellon Lecture titled Why Anthropology Must Learn from Latinx and Ethnic Studies by Professor Arlene Davila. This talk is generously funded by the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation and is part of SAR's recent initiative in Latinx studies. Thank you to the Mellon Foundation for funding this fantastic talk. Before I introduce today's speaker, just a few notes on the structure of the event today. Professor Davila will speak and present a slideshow for about 30 minutes, and then she and I will have a short discussion followed by an open Q&A, question and answers. If you are interested in um, asking a question, please type your question into the Q&A uh, field um, here in Zoom, and we will get to as many questions as possible. If some questions are very similar, we may do some recombining. The event will last just over an hour. Again, thank you for attending and please check SAR's calendar of events and consider a digital membership to the School for Advanced Research. It is my true pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Professor Arlene Davila, with a PhD in cultural anthropology from the Graduate Center of CUNY, um, is a professor of anthropology and American studies at New York University. Professor Davila is the author of six so single authored books um, and uh, three edited volumes, including her single authored books include El Mall, The Spatial and Class Politics of Shopping Malls in Latin America, University of California Press 2016, Culture Works, Space, Value, and Mobility Across the Neoliberal Americas, NYU Press 2012, Latinos Inc, Marketing and the Making of a People, two editions, Latino Spin, Public Image and the Whitewashing of Race, NYU Press 2008, Barrio Dreams, Puerto Ricans, Latinos and the Neoliberal City, University of California Press 2004, and last but not least, Sponsored Identities, Cultural Politics in Puerto Rico, Temple University Press 1997. So with that brief introduction, let me turn it over to Professor Arlene Davila. So sorry, I'll start again. I want to thank Paul Ryer and Margaret Schwetzer and all who logged in today virtually. It's a pleasure to be here. I will start by acknowledging that I speak from the ancestral homelands of the Lenape to assert the longstanding significance of these lands for Lenape nations past and present. When I was approached to do an, the annual Mellon talk at the School for American Research, I was surprised to be invited to speak at such a foundational anthropological space. Because anyone who knows me is aware that I'm over critical of anthropology and have long anchored my work in Latinx and critical ethnic studies instead. But then I was happy to learn that the School of American Research is in fact developing a Latinx studies initiative, which filled me with great hope and optimism to be addressing you at a moment of transformation and change. Thus, in my short remarks, I will address head on why I'm excited to hear about this new Latinx initiative, why I turn to interdisciplinary fields, and why I feel so strongly that anthropology must center and learn from Latinx and ethnic studies to remain relevant in the 21st century. I sustain that centering these fields can lead the discipline to get over its fetishized concern with peoples and cultures and move us to, a more, to more fully engage with racism in the discipline, in the US academy and society at large. I will end by presenting some of the work we're doing at the Latinx Project, an interdisciplinary center at NYU, to highlight the kind of praxis and digital humanities and arts and based initiatives that are so necessary for empowerment in American universities beyond the bounds of any single discipline. My conflicted experience with anthropology is not uncommon and stems from my very entry into the discipline. 
when almost 30 years ago, I was told I couldn't do research in Puerto Rico because I'm Puerto Rican, and this choice would make it impossible to find a job. Now, this ended up being true, as I'll share later, yet imagine my frustration when every day I have to acknowledge this to be the same scenario that most Latinx graduate students face when entering the discipline. When many of the conditions I experience are not very different than those, I have to warn my graduate students about how the discipline works so that they're not disappointed, so that they ignore its shortcomings and still strive. How I have to warn them that they will read a canon center on colonial thinkers like Evans Pritchard and Malinowski, how they'll be working on learning from primarily white faculty, and how they, they should just focus on passing their exams and not give up until they find a freer space in their academic trajectory to do their own research. I'm a senior faculty at NYU, a city that is 30% Latinx and where the majority of the population are people of color. Here, where there are currently no Black faculty in the anthropology department. In fact, in the 20 years I've worked at NYU Anthropology, I've only had one Black colleague in the department who has since left. It is even a total accident that I'm appointed in anthropology. Like many anthropologists of color, I joined the disciplines thanks to interdisciplinary and ethnic studies, and I owe my career to American studies, which was searching for an urban ethnographer and hired me, which required the Department of Anthropology to agree because American studies was then simply a program. I should know that by the time I was hired by American studies at NYU, I had been rejected by over six anthropology departments, despite having a published book, peer-reviewed anthropology publications, major grants, and campus interviews. Later, I learned that every single of my anthropology colleagues who were people of color appointed across New York City, whether at Columbia, at CUNY, or at NYU, were also higher in interdisciplinary spaces, such as in African American studies or Asian Pacific American studies, and then co-appointed in anthropology. Reflecting a trend that still afflicts the discipline, in, afflicts a discipline trapped in a peoples and cultures region centric approach where jobs are crafted around regions and countries, leaving homeless scores of us working in ethnic studies who do research on diasporic identities, migration, and US race and ethnic studies. It is appalling that the composition of most anthropology departments look no different than in 1971, when the first study of anthropology and its minority practitioners was first issued. If you recall, this first study already exposed that minority anthropologists were not being hired in anthropology departments, but were concentrated in interdisciplinary and ethnic study spaces where they were unable to access and train anthropology students and consequently had little ability to transform the discipline. The result is a continued, the continued structural and institutional inequality. How are we going to change the discipline when anthropologists of color are not recognized and valued as authentic anthropologists on account of where they're hired? When we refuse to hire scholars of color, even after they're trained by anthropologists or after they've carried ethnographic research abroad on account that their degree was not in fact in anthropology. The result is the artificial fetishization of the discipline, making it impossible for anthropology departments to diversify and change. In 1971, exposing this state of affairs was frustrating. However, today, almost 50 years later, it is unacceptable and utterly embarrassing. How is it that we're not scandalized by a de facto state of affairs that leads generations of anthropologists to be trained by primarily white anthropologists, leaving our increasingly diverse students to have to learn about ethnic and Latinx studies on their own? In my over 20 years at NYU, it saddens me to admit that I have worked with less than a handful of anthropology graduate students of color and have seen only one anthropology advisee graduate. And I can talk at length here about how these departments craft ideas about who is a real anthropologist, what courses are required to become an anthropologist and how this leaves those of us who teach on ethnic studies at the margin of student training. It is baffling that this racist liberal positionality that unquestionably uplifts a narrow vision of the discipline over cultural studies and ethnic studies, which happen to be the spaces at the vanguard of anti-racist scholarship, continues even when disciplines are supposedly dwindling in their relevance and their existence is consistently threatened. Like, mo like most traditional disciplines, anthropology has increasingly little new and distinctive to offer in an age demanding interdisciplinarity and intersectional approaches. 
It can no longer claim ownership to ethnography or the study of culture as a distinguishing feature, while it remains so strongly identified in the public imagination by its racist and colonial roots. But what I'm personally most upheld by is the continuation of the archaic model of vesting titles of anthropological regional expertise around geographic regions, as in the moniker Latin Americanist, whereby any scholar carrying fieldwork for one year or so in a single fieldwork site in Latin America or any other region of the world is magically and unquestionably recognized as an anthropological expert for entire countries and regions. As we know, faculty searches crafted under these monikers result in the fostering of authoritative expertise amongst scores of anthropologies over diverse and comp complex areas of the world without oftentimes when they do not speak the language of regions they claim expertise on or cite or engage with local scholars writing on topics that pertain to their study. It is overdue time that we stop using these labels of expertise altogether. This type of settled colonial expertise titles need to be seen as a form of symbolic violence towards scholars of color and local communities who are relegated to being simple subjects of study for the primarily white anthropologists who dominate the discipline. In this date and age, this state of affairs also presents an insult to anyone who has ever been the subject of or participated in an anthropological ethnography, because unbeknownst to them, they too have been used to propagate the anthropological expertise facade and further the careers of the mostly white anthropologists who are regularly rewarded with tenure track appointments for claiming undisputed knowledge of, for entire countries and regions of the world. Hence the urgency to acknowledge Latinx and ethnic studies as a source of transformation and renewing. Interdisciplinary spaces that shun nation and region centric identities for diasporic ones, and that place racializing processes at the center of one's study. Before proceeding, I want to clarify that when I use Latinx in Latinx studies, I'm using the gender neutral term for Latinos, Latinas, or people of Latin American backgrounds in the United States. Latinx is often used interchangeably with other terminologies, Latino, Hispanic, or not at all, but I use it purposefully in my research to index its growing currency among younger generations who find previous terminologies like Latino or Hispanic less useful for calling attention to Latinx diversity along the lines of gender, sexuality, and race. Here, the X summons a double take, providing for generative questions about inclusion and representativity. The X marks a new social movement in Latinx representations away from the multiculturalism of the 1990s and the 2000s, which focused on socially constructed commonalities and building identity blocks for claiming representation to today, when more and more we're focusing on the fault lines of Latinx identity and calling attention to its erasures. In other words, when more and more we're saying Latinx is a point of entry to think about Afro-Latinidad indigenous Latinx, and all the different identities that were once erased for the sake of unity, and that now claim or clamor attention as we align Latinx identity with larger anti-racist struggles. This broad thinking highlights issues of colorism and racism within Latinx communities too. While in most departments, any Latinx person is standing for diversity, it is time that all of us and also administrators, chairs, and deans realize that Latinx is not a race, that academia is also dominated by white Latinx, and that we must center, that what we must center is the hiring and recruitment of indigenous and black Latinx anthropologists. In my own research, I find it useful to recognize racial and national privilege in the Latinx community, to begin to recognize the dominance of of Latinx scholars with cultural capital from Latin American academia at large, and the need to center not only Black and Indigenous Latinx, but also those born and raised in the United States who lack the national privilege when coming to the United States, or whose position, whose, who are positioned at the borders of both the United States and Latin American national identities, and who are characterized by the in-betweenness of identities that are so central to Latinx identities. I want to end by pointing you to a forthcoming volume that will be published by the School of American Research, resulting from the convening on Latinx anthropology, which was one of the first convenings that were part of this initiative. Um, and that was organized by Alex Chavez and Gina Perez, which will come out in 2022 and include works by Gilberto Rosas, Andrea Bolivar, Bolivar Cherina Feliciano Santos, Ana Aparicio, Jonathan Rosa, Aime Villarreal, Patricia Sabela, Vanessa Diaz, Sergio Lemus, and more and which provides a bold refusal to all types of anthropological myth-making, 
like the peoples and countries approach in anthropology that I've already challenged at length. What they promote in the volume is an anthropology that engages in a politics of refusal, refusal to work and theorize and write according to the dominant canons of anthropological modeling, anthropology modeling and revolutionary ethics that all scholars should learn from. Our colleagues call for an anthropology that adopts a critical reflexivity designed to promote equality and justice inducing social transformation. Central here is their active questioning of the politics of scholarship that centers collaborations and that advocates for the people and communities who are central to our work. This is revolutionary because in uncertain terms, they say, stop, let's stop appropriating people's theorizations, words and histories and experiences for our own academic and career benefit without a consideration of the politics of research. They call for a research that is rigorously ethical and that starts by the foundational questions of what is a research, research for, who benefits from it, who do we write for? And more personally, it asks scholars to come to terms with the levels of privilege that should be at the heart of any rigorous self-reckoning. One of the things that you'll find when you read the volume is how much they are inspired, cite, and learn from Black, Latinx, and Chicana feminist and ethnic studies and interdisciplinary scholars, fully aware that it is these scholars who have written more critically about matters of race, racialization, and structural inequalities in the United States who can more deeply inform their theorizing and work. Most of all, they provide examples of how, how our own communities and personal experiences are productive and revolutionary spaces for our research. Uh, challenging this fetish for the other and the uncritical pension for travel and discovery that has long hampered anthropologists' imaginations. There's just the type of intersectional analysis everyone talks about, yet few scholars actually do, but that are standard practice in Latinx studies, which demand accounting for the interplay of class, race, gender, sexuality, and citizenship, among other variables affecting Latinx identities, which comprise such diverse populations with multi-diverse identities. Imagine if all anthropologists started the research with a rigorous questioning of our own identities, backgrounds, and positionality, instead of instinctively choosing fieldwork, and, and if it's instead of instinctively choosing fieldwork sites based on access, familiarity, or our own imaginations, be a place we have travel or is convenient to family or partners, or we may have fancied from media tales or popular culture, we would instead choose fieldwork sites based on where we had greatest access to mobilizing our own identities, access and backgrounds in the service of anti-racist research and practice. I est estimate that we would then have a lot more ethnographies of power that expose the workings of white privilege than we do now, if anthropologists would stop going elsewhere to study power before we fully extricated how it operates at home. By uplifting the work of Latinx anthropologists as example, let it be clear that no one is advocating for politics of authenticity or our backgrounds dictate the type of research and the issues we study. Instead, the call is to stop reproducing this fetish for research outside of our communities that has produced generations of lukewarm apolitical work and sometimes even overtly racist work when we could be engaging in far more prescient ethnographic explorations and foremost to reckon with our identities and privileges and use this knowledge to pursue and engage in the most significant and valuable work that would lead us to do the anti-racist anthropological futurity, futurity that we all strive for. Um, so I look forward to this publication um, because it's timely and daring, and I hope that it will help all of us to start engaging in the ethnographic refusals and to become unruly anthropologists with pride. And I want to turn, if, if Margaret helps me, to a PowerPoint presentation very quickly, because I'm now going to turn to something entirely different, which is um, a lot of the work that we're doing, which to me is, is perhaps where I have found the most, um, the most inspiration, I would say, in this past um, this past four years for sure. Um, and that, that is, it's a project that is also funded by Mellon. Um, so I want to uh, share with you uh, some of this work. Let me, um, I'm sorry, I'm just trying to, okay, here we go. Okay, so um, I want to start with the first slide because the issue, um, uh, to highlight, I've, I've talked about the issue of um, 
the diversity in academic, uh, academic departments in anthropology, I would say the lack of diversity. And this is an issue that affects visibility, not only in universities, but also in museums, in cultural institutions. And it's exactly what I address in my last book, Latinx Art. Um, and you know, I'll show you uh, what, I, what I have here in these charts is some of the studies that you may be familiar with by Mellon and the Gottman Center at CUNY showing the disparities in employment in art museum and, and cultural sector, especially in the positions of power. And the huge gaps at the level of, um, of gallery representation for Latinx artists. Next, in this chart, what you will see is in greater detail how Latinx are not only missing in museums, but they're more even more invisible in positions of power. When you think about board directors, curators, in those powerful decision making positions most responsible for creating value in the cultural field, not unlike you would find in academia in regards to chairs, deans, provost, and um, boards, right, university boards, vis-a-vis, um, -vis, for instance, the adjunct body or the assistant professor body, where you will likely find more diversity. Um, this is what brings me to the Latinx project at NYU. Uh, next slide, please. In 2018, as a result of a retention offer um, that allowed me to access some seeding funds, um, uh, the Latinx project came to life at NYU. It was funded by Mellon and also by Ford Foundation. Um, and basically what we're trying to do is address the huge gap in Latinx studies at NYU, but also this is a trend across major universities at NYU, for instance, where we have vibrant centers for African-American affairs and Asian Pacific American studies, Latin American studies and so forth for at least 20 years. Latinx studies uh, had not been, they didn't have an institute or a center. Um, and that meant that we had no resources for hosting artists, scholars, programming, and so forth. So what I set out to do was create the institute and the space that we should have had 20 years ago. Um, we got to work very quickly. And I show the team, uh, because a lot of them are part-time, very few are full-time, but one of the key um, excuses that I always hear in the level of universities and positions of power and, and museums is the idea of like, you know, we don't have the talent, right? Where are you gonna find Latinx people, you know? Um, and what I have found repeatedly is that there's such an excess of talent in our community because all of the positions were the result of open calls that led to hundreds of people applying for positions. And absolutely, there's an excess of curators, there's an excess of art professionals, there's absolutely an excess of professors out there. The question is, why are they not being hired? Why are we not looking at these applicants? Um, next. The first thing that we began to do was interdisciplinary work. Um, and these conferences have been so rewarding. Um, in particular, um, conferences like, for instance, Digitizing Race, looking at the intersection of digital technologies and how it's shaping the way we think and understand te technologies of race and Latinx identities, which was co-organized by an anthropology student, uh, Marcel Salas, who was an open call. Um, Latinx uh, politics, which we did at the heels of the last election, and a whole conference that we did uh, as a result of a fellowship that we instituted focusing on Afro-Latinx studies. It's so important right now to really explore uh, this field. It's one of the fastest growing fields and also one of the most difficult fields to educate our chairs about and our deans about. The fact that it's not only Latinx studies, but also we also have to do when you think about Latinx studies, we also have to focus on Afro-Latinx studies. We have to hire people that focus on Central American studies. We have to focus on Dominican scholars. Um, it's just not uh, a one size fits all. Um, and, and what we're hoping to do is model the kind of, you know, more intersectional attention to all of the different fields that are central when we think about Latinx studies at large. Next. Uh, we immediately knew that we had to start with artists because the lack of an institutional space at NYU meant that we did not have the ability to host artists like other institutes do regularly. And the first artist in residence was Chelene Rodriguez, uh, a Bronx-based interdisciplinary artist. This call was invitational, but we have since had open calls and every year we have more artists apply from all over the United States. Uh, in fact, this past year, our artist in residence was the photographer William Camargo, hail, hailing from Anaheim, California. 
Um, and it is especially exciting to host these artists alongside scholars, um, such as uh, Omaris, um, um, our first uh, inaugural medium, Jimenez Roman Afro-Latinx fellow, Omaris Zamora from Rutgers University, um, and also Ariana Valle from um, Los Angeles. Um, and how, and, and to see these conversations that are only possible when you have a space that not only makes a distinction between artists and scholars, but also has this kind of larger community where you actually have in, um, conversations um, feeding into each other. And if, uh, um, I'll turn to the next slide, uh, please. Um, this will give you a little sense of the exhibitions that we have done. I call them interventions more than exhibitions because all of them, they're done through open calls, but all of them are engaging with hot topic issues that are so important in our community, such as issues of um, gentrification, um, 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 yes, um, um, gentrification and precarity, urban precarity, or the African roots of, of Latinx culture, or uh, settled colonialism and indigeneity in the border. Um, and this year we held three uh, exhibitions that were digital due to COVID, uh, including cyber healing, exploring how artists are finding healing in the digital realm. William Camargo's exhibition, which provided a corrective to the photographic canon centering Latinx subjects, while exploring issues of surveillance in our communities. And last, Marisa del Toro's Cruising the Horizon, focusing on queer futurity after our colleagues Jose Muñoz's work. All of these exhibitions are also the result of open calls that are open to curators, scholars, and artists. And all of these conversations, whether it is the curators, the exhibitions, and also the artists in residence, are uh, applications that are read by, by um, former artists, former curators, our community board of faculty, and also invited scholars and invited um, uh, curators. Uh, which also helps create linkages and connections with a wider community um, and also helps uh, people know and learn about our artists. Um, Pelea was our first and um, this was uh, an is this is basically um, one of the first, the first basically the inaugural show, uh, which highlighted issues of gentrification and precarity. And you have here a sample of the works, which included Roy Bassan, a Mexican American photographer, um, providing very assertive and uplifting images of Black masculinity in the Bronx, uh, with an image of Black fathers and their children that you seldom see in mainstream representations of the Bronx. Melissa Calderon, who's a New Yorkian artist also from the Bronx, and her embroidered couch, were part, which are part of her unemployed life series depicting scenes of economic uncertainty and precarity. Groana Melendez, uh, a Dominican New York photographer. Uh, this piece is called Mammy's Bureau that speaks to the overcrowded apartments that result from, from higher rents and gentrification, but also to the dreams and aspirations for better worlds echoed in the Bureau hinting at lavish gold consumer materials and self-care. And last, Carlos Jesus Martinez, a detail of eastbound displacement, which was an installation that speaks to patterns of displacement of Latinx residents from Washington Heights to the Bronx, a story that is told through an appropriated object, in this case, a, um, um, a sign, a, a stop sign, public, the public sign, which also speaks to growing struggles of, of our public space in most upper Manhattan communities. The next slide is of our exhibition Afrocene Critique, which was also curated by an artist. This time it was Yelene Rodriguez, who was a master's student in Latin American studies and museum studies at NYU when she curated the show. And you get the sense here of the range of, sh of, of, of works. Um, from pop art to assemblages to uh, collage to prints, uh, paintings, and more, to make a point um, that I make over and over in my book, Latinx Art, which is so important to challenge this idea that there's one look, right, one aesthetic when we, when we think about Latinx artists. Oftentimes, when we think about Latinx artists and artists of color, we have this tendency to um, to imagine that you could read identity on the work of these artists. And um, what I try to do, and you know, what are, all of our exhibitions do is challenge this, this association by highlighting the diversity and, uh, and of genres of aesthetics. 
Um, here you'll see um, works that speak about the African roots in Latinx culture, whether it is in food and music, as in Melissa Misla La Cocinita, the kitchen, or Olucia Hierro's assemblage of constituent elements of merengue, or through proud and assertive images of the Black body, as in Tiffany Alfonseca's um, painting, What a Real Barbie Looks Like. Or last, Fabiola Jean Lewis, Marie Antoinette is Dead. Um, and that talk back and invert the colonial hierarchies of value by highlighting and foregrounding the El Negro detrás de la oreja or the black behind the ear. As in Patricia Encarnacion's digital print of the yucca grinder with the European pattern ceramic chip yucca. So um, I'll jump quickly to the next slide, which was by our artist in residence from El Paso, uh, Vic Quesada, two years ago. This was the last exhibition we had before COVID that allowed us to foreground the work of a trans indigenous Latinx artist who was winner, the winner of our open call that year. Vic's works are all about retelling histories and talking back to settled colonial past. In this case, their installation consisted of video, um, and photographs of their performance a walk in El Paso, Texas, dressed in a costume drawing from Nahual and Aztec myths with a cedar, seeding and reclaiming new memories onto the landscape. Now, due to COVID, we haven't had much events, but one of the key elements that I want to highlight, um, the next slide please, is our community. Um, and one of the most rewarding elements of our conversation of, of what we're trying to do is, is this public facing and the public humanity component, the importance of creating audiences, networks, and opportunities for new generations. Our exhibitions were visited by high school students and community colleges who had never seen artists like them represented in a, any type of gallery setting. Um, and how moving it was to see visitors feeling seen, represented, and appreciated. Last, social archives. Social media are so central and archives are so central to our work. Next slide, please. Um, um, most of our events are available and can be used for classes. Uh, most recently, we initiated a database for all the artists that we have shown, as well as resources on Latinx um, uh, research. Um, and, and this is one of the key takeaways from my research on Latinx art that, that when you think about value, it's not only about exhibiting or visibilizing Latinx culture, but also documenting, writing about our artists, our historic creators, because it is not enough to exhibit them. We also have to, there's a huge void of people to write about our artists, our creators, our history. So this is actually what we're trying to do with this digital archives and also last with digital with our digital publication called interventions and if there are people in the audience here that are interested in writing we're always looking for people to write about our artists or to write about our exhibitions or about um, book reviews um, so important to begin to not only focus on you know the tenure reviews and you know all the peer review but to to, to actually create um, value creating high impact, um, high impact, uh, quick takeaways. Um, next, please, which is what we're doing with interventions. Um, interventions has grown very quickly. We have produced over 70 um, pieces which are um, available um, on the web um, and that are documented. They're doing what the art press is not doing, what um, what the art and style sections are not doing and what you don't see any other major um, publication do, which is really focus on Latinx art, history and creativity. Now, there's so much more work ahead for us, but for today, um, I just want to uh, thank others, thank the opportunity to share about this work um, and also the Mellon Foundation for making not only this talk possible, but the fellowship program at the School of American Research and also the Latinx project possible. Um, it is so important that now universities follow the lead and ensure that all these projects and all these programs are sustainable to ensure that Latinx studies is never again homeless in American universities. So I'll leave you with that. And I know Paul is gonna come up here to have a conversation with me. So I look forward to that. Thank you. Oh, wow. That was fantastic. Thank you so much, Arlene. I, 
I had so many thoughts from your presentation that my prepared questions, I want to throw them away. Um, maybe we can get to that. But let me just start. I, I don't know if you know this, uh, the, some of the nuances of the institution that I'm coming from out, out in Santa Fe. Um, SAR has for a long time had about six scholars per year come to write a book. Uh, scholars from different backgrounds, scholars from uh, at different career stages. But for a number of decades now, we have also had on campus uh, two interns in, in the Indian Arts Research Center and uh, three, three artists in residence, which is exactly. almost exactly what you're talking about. And that we call it the peculiar alchemy. We have a, we, we published a book uh, about SAR, uh, the history of SAR, and it's titled A Peculiar Alchemy. We see that as an alchemical kind of um, uh, process where, where artists who are, who are Native, uh, Native American or Native uh, uh, First Nations or, or Native Hawaiian come together with the scholars who are doing different kinds of projects, and the scholars' work is so enriched um, very often by by engagement with uh, with living artists and the artists are sometimes inspired by the scholarly work and the scholarly ways of seeing and thinking but together there's this kind of um, ferment that is really spectacular now it doesn't always work for every project but boy is it special when it does so for example we had an archaeologist here last year patty crown studying uh, some some artifacts from Chaco Canyon. And she became friends with an artist in residence who was Hopi and who had worked with, you know, making objects and could talk to her about what it's like to make the object, the kinds of objects she was yeah. thinking about. And so, and, and th that kind of, I don't know, I think alchemy is a good word actually for, for that. That kind of process is really spectacular and it's so exciting to me. And I think to others who are tuning in from SAR, um, to see that you're doing something analogous, totally different, you know, site in New York City, but it's really spectacular um, kind of overlap in, in what you're doing. So thank you for that. And um, that that really just is not even a question. It's just an observation. And you're just over and over the stuff you were talking about. I think I saw your 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 first slide, the digitizing race conference. It looked like that was one of the people there was Hector Beltran, who was one of our fellows two years ago. And just uh, doing really fascinating work as well. So I, I'm seeing so much overlap, even though Absolutely. on the surface, you know, we're the other end of the country, we have a different sort of um, local context, but lots of overlap. If I could ask you a question, uh, a couple of questions, um, I don't I don't wanna take too much time. I wanna get to the Q&A as well, but, and, and this follows from the comment about this overlap, but, how would you reflect upon the relationship between Latinx and Native arts and artists? What, what, how would you sort of think about that? Yeah, uh, no, absolutely. Um, I, I think that one of the most exciting things that we're seeing now in this present moment is this attention to the multidiverse identities. And there is, um, I, I feel that especially with Native American and with, with indigeneity, right? With, with indigenous Latinx identities, I, there is an incredible growth and interest, especially in younger generations. And you see that also in our artistic community, but also our younger generations that are uh, US born that are actually searching for that, right? Um, I, I find that, that, that there's something very similar happening to what we saw with Afro-Latinx studies, right? When Afro-Latinx studies began, um, you had a moment, right? A, a, all of a sudden, an emphasis in our community to really reclaim Black Latinidad and Blackness as an identity within Latinidad. The same thing is happening now with indigenous Latinx groups. And what's fascinating here is that a lot of that reckoning and reassessment um, uh, relies on cultural work, on memory and self-making invention and also history um, because a lot of our communities are displaced dispossessed many of our indigenous communities in latin america when, after when they've come here that identity has been attacked and racialized from so many different angles that what we're seeing here in the context of the united states is a is a renewal that is fascinating in regards to how centered it is around issues of racial identity but also how centered it is 
um, with a kind of self, a rejection, right? A rejection to this kind of narrowing authenticity, you know, notions of authenticity that, um, that I think we're used to, right? When we think about the United States, we have this very strict ideas of who Native American identities, you know, what is, what it should look like, who is allowed, who's not. When you have the Latinx indigeneity conversation, you have a conversation that is filled with, you know, memories, dreams, histories, rescue, and also a self-making that is very intentional, is very anti-colonial, and is also rejecting a myth of mestizaje that is very exciting. So I think I find it a, a very promising space for developing anti-racist thinking in our community, especially in, in, in how much it is also centering racial identification and awareness of, raci of racism in this country. So I'll, I'll just say that, but when you think about um, some of the artists that, you know, Vic Quesada, for instance, but also, um, you, you don't you don't see that also in artists uh, who are Mexican American, also Puerto Rican artists. I'm thinking of Glenda Liz, um, uh, and Glenda Liz Medina, who is Afro Latinx, but also is rescuing indigenous identity, and and that's also exciting too, right? Especially in Caribbean populations, um, that we're also beginning to trouble this identity by not thinking also in terms of narrow indigenous identities, but also, you know, how do we think about black indigeneity, right? Which is so central for when you think about Latinx. So I think the Latinx conversation is, is really bringing a lot of conversations and issues around indigeneity that, that open up conversations around race um, and, and also could, could be a point for making connections hemispherically too. Mm -hmm. Interesting. I mean, broadly speaking, it seems to me that the kind of indigeneity you're you're talking about, Latinx indigeneity, is is in a sense there's a mobility built into it that might be different uh, out here in in the Southwest. Yeah. Uh, and and um, and I I like that. I think it's you know so important to to destabilize the the kind of the frameworks were handed down with about identities being discrete and separable and um, monolithic. And, and I think that's always important. And that's speaking as a social scientist. I do have a, one, of, one of my favorite uh, lines in, in social theory is from Anna Singh, and who was an anthropologist who had thought and focused on migration. And she just cautions in one of her books, I'm trying to remember which one, um, that as we focus on migration and movement, we not leave behind the left behind. And so there's, there's a little tension there. I think here in the Southwest, we don't leave behind the left behind, but we don't focus on movement as much as what you're describing, the world you're describing, the East Coast and the, and the, uh, uh, and you, one can see this in some of the artwork you, you illustrated your talk with. Um, but I think there's, it's hard to find the right balance. So um, anyway, it's, it's really lovely to think. We're going to have another, we had a, a great conversation that is in the archives on critical indigeneities last year. Uh -huh. And we're planning our fall uh, lineup right now, and we will have a, con a critical indigeneities too. And frankly, we could have critical indigeneities three, four, five, the conversation should, should you know, has so much, right, is very rich and is, is, is totally under development right now. So I welcome everyone who's interested, especially uh, our audience from, you know, from New Mexico to tune in and, and, and listen up and be part of that conversation that promises to be extremely illuminating around these issues. Terrific, terrific, thank you. Um, how are we on time? Um, I think I have time for another question. Um, going back to the beginning of your talk, you, you, you had a critique of anthropology, which I just loved, actually. I thought that was brilliant and needs to be said and heard um, by many. Um, I have heard versions of that before, but it was really, uh, really well done. So, so the question, might be the second part of your presentation when you talked about the Latinx project that you're heading. What can that teach anthropology? I, maybe you don't want to bother and anthropology as a discipline is a form that needs yeah. to just go away, but maybe there's something salvageable there that it can be, that the work you're doing can teach. So what, if you could, I don't know, perhaps think of, is there a way you could summarize that? What is there? I, I, oh my God, I, I think, you know, what a great question. I didn't think of, you know, um, 
you know, if, if anthropology would center um, Black and Indigenous Latinx or, you know, not only Latinx, you know, but also, um, you know, people of color, like imagine what it would look like if our departments would look like a sliver of the U.S. demographics around the cities in which they're located look like. Mm -hmm. Just that. Because, you know, at the Latinx Project, we're constantly having a, that conversation, right? Uh, ensuring that, you know, that, you know, Latinx is so diverse, right? How, how do we ensure when we look at applications, curators, artists, this, our programming, there's so many conversations, right? You know, we can't just have like, you know, Puerto Rican scholars or, you know, Dominican scholars. It's just so diverse, right? Ensuring that, you know, uh, Afro-Latinx scholars, you know, are represented, um, that, that are West Coast, you know, so that will come, that's a that's kind of rigorous self reflectivity around representation. Mm -hmm. um, I I would love uh, to see anthropology departments. I don't think anthropology departments have ever looked around and even wondered about their whiteness, and that to me is the most appalling thing. How is it possible that anthropology is not alarmed, embarrassed, and shocked? to just see around and see that there's no black, black anthropologies around us. Mm -hmm. That to me is like, we just have like Black Lives Matter, the real reckoning around racism throughout so many industries from publishing to museums. Why are anthropology departments not up in arms, like really like ch changing the way they do business? I, that, I'll never understand that. So I think that, that that to me is the most frustrating and not only to me, but to so many scholars, that, um, you know, it's just the state of affairs. It's just not acceptable. This is never, will never be acceptable, um, you know? And, and I'm like older, you know, I've been around. I'm like, I'm like, I've given up, right? But if anybody's out there listening, you know, it's embarrassing that, that the anthropology pretends to be a discipline of diversity and that it looks the way it looks. And I, you know, uh, I was trying to think, you know, can we think of a department right now that models the forward thinking diversity, I can think of one. I mean, if there's one place I wanna hear people out there correct me and tell me, no, Arlene, look at this department, they're doing this. Uh, I wanna know what department that is. I, I don't know, and I would love to, to know because it's, that's, that's what we need. So, but yeah, that, that's kind of what I would, you know, and, and I'm sorry that I am like emphatic on my response, but you know, it's, it's um, there's so many departments um, where you don't have people of color in their faculty. And sometimes we, we criticize all uh, uh, disciplines like political science or economics or philosophy, right? For being uh, very white dominant, but you know, it doesn't make any sense that anthropology would also look like that too. Yeah. Um, let me see if we have any questions. And um, I guess you and I are going to um, start answering the questions. Yes. I can come back. I had more, <laughs> more of my own, but I, I want to give our audience a chance to speak and be heard. So would you like to read out this first one or would you like? Yeah, I guess, you know, um, this is by, uh, from John Price. Can you repeat your critique of anthropology more slowly or in a different way? You know, the, one of the good things with Zoom is that things like, right, are, <laughs> are in, you know, I'm, all I'm saying is very simple. It's just what I just said, you know, which is, you know, anthropology has not rigorously changed and it's, um, my, my big critique was in the fetishization of regions and countries that makes it impossible for people that work in the United States on Latinx studies and African-American studies to be hired mm -hmm. um, and, and how we, we end up with searches and departments that are white dominant and oftentimes because we have this kind of region centric idea that where we fetishize anthropologists who don't feel work abroad. Um, but mainly it's just, it goes back to my main critique is the is the lack of diversity, the lack of diversity in the faculty, um, the lack of diversity that then repeats itself and makes it impossible for the discipline to change. Um, so that's a very simple, that would be my, my slow and, um, you know, succinct um, critique. Um, and then for the second question, it's too long, but maybe you could help me with that. Sure. Sure. Um... I'll, I'll read it and you can think about your answer. And it does, um, it does flow from this. 
previous From one. From the same uh, question, yeah. yeah. Early in your talk, I'm reading, uh, this is an anonymous question. Early in your talk, you seemed to repudiate more than a century of anthropological research. And yet all anthropologists stand on the shoulders of giants, albeit flawed giants whose ideas reflected their times, reflect their times. How can we think about the discipline in a nuanced way that acknowledges that all of us, including you and I, are creatures of our historical moment and that years from now, what seems self-evident and morally defensible to us may look misguided in the future? Oof. Yeah, I, I guess, you know, the most important thing is I go back to, you know, we can make many arguments about discipline and, you know, and the limits and so forth. Uh, I think that the what I want to really look at is the makeup of, you know, why it is that most anthropologists of color are hired in ethnic studies, American studies, urban studies, gender studies, whatever, but not in anthropology. I think that that's the key thing. Imagine, I, I think, and that's, you know, I'm, I'm not kind of highlighting the ideas that I don't want to get into philosophical arguments about the historical development of the discipline. I think that our argument is so huge. Perhaps my critique is more of a political economy about who gets jobs and who doesn't get jobs and how how is the epistemological ideas of the discipline impact who gets jobs and as a result, who can train students and as a result, who, how the discipline can change or not change, right? And I think that that's the kind of pattern that in 1970 one, the first report of anthropology and minority made so clear, right? Already they said, hey, all the black anthropologists are not being hired in anthropology, right? This is the same situation that happens today. So that's the, the big critique um, that right. I think, you know. Right. It, it, I, that's the way I heard you as well. You're not critiquing the anthropological work of individual people. You're critiquing the structure. Absolutely. That reinforces and reproduces certain kinds. In fact, Ruth Bahar, Women Writing Culture, the article, the, her chapter, Women Writing Culture, in what was that, 1991, made that exact same point in a slightly different context, of course, critiquing the, the, the book Writing Culture. But um, it, it, there are structures in, in, of, in which uh, a, a white guy, Franz Boas, becomes the founder and and Zora Neale Hurston does not, it hardly gets a footnote, right? And so th those are the, that's what you're talking about. You're, you're talking about structure, not, Absolutely. not individual work. Yeah. Absolutely, thank you for clarifying that, Paul. Yeah, no, no of course, um, let's see how many more we have. Uh, do you want to take the next question, or would you like me to read that as well? You're you're the main answerer. Yeah, this is, I it. hope you know um, there is Paul uh, wishes for more connections between Latinx artists outside of New York and the Latinx project grow. So many of us have been long struggling with conservative areas in the interior of the country, and um, I, I would say that that's so important. You know, we tend to one of the problems with Latinx studies and also the appreciation of Latinx art is that we tend to focus these ideas that you know we think of Latinx, you know, we think of Los Angeles or we think of New York and maybe Chicago right and hello you know latinx people are 18 percent of the population of the entire united states you know they are everywhere they're in you know rural areas suburban areas and interior right so absolutely we need to go beyond this kind of like you know urban centric dominant view and and i would say to that is paulo that our that one of the things that we're doing in the Latinx project is, you know, we we function through open calls, right? Anyone can apply, and in particularly in the digitizing um, uh, for the for the interventions. I'm sorry for the interventions blog, and I've been I've been actually wanting a curator or somebody to write about exactly, you know, Latinx artists in other places. You know, we we need we need people to be like, hey, you know. To, to begin to contribute uh, write-ups that highlight uh, with works and pictures and images. So um, yeah, there's always a call for that, those kinds of, you know, um, in, in intervention. So um, uh, Paulo, uh, I would say, please pitch us something that tells us a little bit about the Latinx artists that you're talking about in those conservative interior countries, because we'd like, we love, we'd love to know about them. Um, and then John Price asked, what is fetishizing? That's a great question. A great we, question. Use all this, we use this <laughs> jargon, and I don't want to go into Marxist theory 101, you know, like, yeah. what is the fetish, right? But I use it to kind of like uh, refer to the ways in which, you know, we tend to kind of have these ideas of the discipline, right, that we, that we have, you know, we foster the discipline with this kind of authenticated ideas and superpowers of, right, of what it should be that limit, right? 
that 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 make it impossible for ethnic that that shun it away from that separate it from ethnic studies or Latinx studies, and that's kind of what I was referring to in my talk, right? It does come from Marx originally, doesn't it? Um, the fetish he wrote about. Uh, and then, of course, he used it to talk about the fetishization of commodities. But you're using it in a very different way. But I think that's that's where the to add to to, to add to her her question, your answer to her question. It did start with Marx, I, I believe, in terms of uh, the the term commodity, um, the, the commodity fetishism. The commodity right? fetish, exactly. Um, so the next two questions are about uh, particular departments and um, yeah. check out the. You know, Marilyn Guida says, check out the University of Texas at El Paso Department of Anthropology for Diversity in El Paso. We do have an 80% or more Latinx population living here and students coming from Juarez. Um, so I, I'll have to go look at their website to see. Yeah, I, I would like to know if Marilyn thinks that that means that, you know, the, 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 that the faculty is 80% Latino. That's what I want to ask. I, um, Marilyn Guida, if you have 80% of Latino population, you know, in the, you know, do you also have 80% of the faculty Latino, Latinx? I mean, if that's the case, Viva El Paso, I need to go and check out that department as an example. For sure. Um, uh, and there's a, another comment uh, about, um, from Linda Hull. Um, when I received my BA from Florida State, our small anthropology department had two Mexican professors, a gay professor, a Chinese professor, several women. There wasn't any sense of being top heavy in white professors. That was just my experience in the early 70s. To, 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 if I may add my own experience, Chicago, yeah. University of Chicago, when I got there, there were, I believe, 30 professors and I think three women and one faculty person of color, which was Arjuna Bhattarai at that time. And it, so it really was white and male. I mean, really, sort of start, startlingly so. It is not anymore. But so I think it varies. Maybe Florida State was an unusual place at that for the 70s but you know I one one of the issues that I that I also think is that you know in the 1970s you know I uh, I graduated from CUNY right from CUNY the graduate center where uh, you did have uh, and my advisor was Delmas Jones an African American um, mm -hmm. anthropologist you had Leif Mullins and you had mm -hmm. Delmas Jones both of them had been hired I believe in the 70s um, I think that there was a moment of more diversity but the problem is that those were the only black faculty they had for like at least 20 years. Right. So that's kind of one of the big problems, too, is that when you consider the demographic diversity of Latinx populations and black and, and, and people of color in general, when you consider the demographic growth, the diversity in departments have not only grown, but it's actually it's, it's less com compared to relative to their numeric growth. Right. And that's also something that we think of, oh, well, we used to have two and now we have three people of color. I'm like, at that point, you know, within within those 20 years, the population has almost doubled. You know, we almost have 30 percent of, the, you know, in, in, in New York City, for instance. So right. the fact that we have two people of color in a department where you have doubled the people demographically and the student body that is people of color. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. So I think that we need to sort of think in those terms, not only in the number of people you see, but also like what does the student body look like? Right. right? What are they clamoring for? And do they why why is it that they don't get to see themselves represented, mm -hmm. you know? Right. In these fields. Right. You can't measure only against the past or on, against a static sense of diversity, but against the dynamic change in the society at large. Absolutely. Yeah, that's brilliant. Uh, this is a lovely long question from Miriam Kolar. Do you want me to read it out or did you already read it through? I haven't yet. <laughs> so if you want to read it. Uh, um... Okay, I'll read it. Um, the representation concerns your work address addresses along with the work towards demographic recentering are crucial across the academy beyond just anthropology, sociology and ethnomusicology or ethno arts programs. For anthropology, there's also the issue that Tim Ingold, among others, is addressing about the overuse of the term ethnography, along with a suggestion that we are mostly doing co-authoring of research instead and should recognize sharing of knowledge as co-authorship. Yeah. In his 2014 critique, Ingold advocates for, quote, reasserting the value of anthropology as a forward-moving discipline dedicated to healing the rupture between imagination and real life. Could you talk about this issue and your perspective? Yeah, I unfortunately do not know uh, Tim Ingold's critique. 
um, which I should read to to understand. But I I probably uh, would agree with a lot of what he's saying. You know, this kind of extractivist notion of what ethnography, how ethnography works. Um, you know, and how we use people's words, statements. Uh, we're supposed to analyze them, right? Like that's what the anthropologist does. But the you know, this idea that that people that we work with provide um, prime prime matter, right? And that we give value to whatever they say because we are the ones who analyzed. But it's really people are right theorists also in their own thinking. So I mean, I've done you know I've worked. I was trained like that. You know, when I go back to my first books, born for identities. You know, I even use a pseudonym for Umakao. You know, I call it Koane. You know, because I was like using the standards of what I was taught I had to do. You know, but like my goodness, you know, like. Yeah, to me has been so important and so liberatory. And when I began to just use people's real names, you know, like to me, because my work is also about documenting, right? Documenting what people are doing. Puerto Ricans in this Harlem, right? Um, like in Barrio Dreams, for instance, and showing everyone that was quoted what they were quoted as saying, right? Like that's something actually that, you know, that's how I work. Like, you know, when you go to Barrio Dreams, every quote from every person, like I showed it, hey, this is how you're going to, do you want me to use your name? Do you approve it? Painstaking work. But, you know, there is this kind of like, how do we begin to, to you know, whether it is as co-authoring or whether it is as having more, more rigorous involvement of the people we work with. I think that there is absolutely, I mean, the other thing is that now like this kind of ethnographic tool, right? It's, it's so used by, you know, marketers, cultural mm -hmm. studies, journalists, right? It's widely used, right? So I also don't want to fetishize, you know, using the word again, you know, like, like, <laughs> you know, like oh, there you go, you know, um, you know, like, like, like essentialize or try to like, you know, like imagine that what we do is so, so different, right? Mm -hmm. Um, because that's the other thing, you know, anthropology has has tried to say, oh, the way we do ethnography is better, right? Mm -hmm. You've all heard of that, right? That we only us do ethnography the right way and other spaces, right? Don't have the rigor or are more journalistic, right? All of these put downs that we use to kind of like highlight the difference between the anthropological ethnography and those who do ethnography. I think that all of that is nonsense. In reality, we're all doing what we can but this notion of how do we reassert the value of, um, you know, how do we, we begin to, to, to really rethink, think about what it is that, you know, that we do when we use other people's voices and words and how much of that is our own imaginations, our own projections. I mean, there's a lot to explore. Um, so thank you, Miriam. I don't have an answer other than I think your, your, your statement is very provocative and, I look forward to learning more about, you know, the author you quoted. Let's see if there's more. You know, they, they're coming, they keep coming in. Yes. Um, well, so uh, we, we heard back from Marilyn regarding the El Paso uh, department and she says, I haven't calculated, but it is diverse beyond Latinx. Yeah, and Miriam Collar uh, also um, highlights uh, so important to let people speak on their own words and 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 stand for them. Um, you know, yeah. And also, I was in and not stand up for them, right? Not like not be like the interlocutors, like like just just people are brilliant. You know, that's why we we cite them often, right? Right. There's this there's this tradition in anthropology of of trying to put a scientific spin on on our understanding and our interpretations of things, and that's it's kind of absurd it's it's we're humans standing beside other humans i'm now i'm paraphrasing uh, clifford gertz i think but um trying to make sense of 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 something that we're ourselves part of and so the idea that we stand apart and that we can analyze it like a chemical reaction in a beaker or something has never really worked but it has been our anthropological tradition so yeah there's a a, a kind of humility that comes with recognizing that we're it's it's also like it's something like linguists recognizing that you can only understand you can come to understand things about language but you only do it through language and there's a kind of a weird kind of reflexivity built into that just like we have in in ethnographic work um 
there, there was one more question or anonymous comment, and it was, I think it would be interesting to study the Latinx art scene in San Antonio and the makeup of faculties at area, area universities. It's very interesting, Arlene, you, your, your talk really brought out the anthropologists. I was expecting a lot more uh, questions and comments from uh, about the Latinx and the arts side, since that is a big part of our audience in general. As I said earlier, you know, we have this peculiar alchemy at SAR of arts and scholarship. Yeah. But you really have, must have hit a nerve with the Well, then that's fantastic <laughs> because I really hope the anthropologists get my message that absolutely look at the composition. You know, I, I think it's very frustrating for all of us who work in, you know, in American universities and research one universities to see departments be so hesitant and so fearful. I sometimes feel like it's just fearful. It's like real fear of change. Um, and, and, um, and, and that is only making so many of us say, you know, we don't care about anthropology, you know, moving on as opposed to be invested in this space, which is exactly what anthropology needs. Anthropology needs. And in a way, I have to say, I am at, uh, I am at all at younger generations that are like that, the people that, you know, Gina Perez that did this unruly Latinidades. I was like, wow, they did that. Because I'll be like, you know, keep it going. I'm just not even going to do anthropology anymore. I do my own thing. But there's younger generations are so committed to transforming the discipline. And I would say, what a great, what if, you know, anthropology is so lucky, right? To have young scholars like that, that are like knocking on doors, writing in American anthropologies and doing all that stuff and like not giving up. And that's that's inspiring, right? That they're doing that. And I think that my fear and what my question is, how would they be like 20 years from now, right? Because I can relate a little bit. You know, I once was like, yes, I'm gonna write here, I'm gonna publish here, and I'm gonna change anthropology. If I didn't change anything, I couldn't even get anyone. I couldn't even um, hire people of color, right? I, so it's frustrating, right? Mm -hmm. um, but I, but maybe they'll have a better shot, right? And 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 I think anthropology. If there's anyone out there, any senior person, any deans, any, you know, take advantage of the people that are willing to do that work now, mm -hmm. because maybe one day they won't be there, mm -hmm. right? Maybe the next generation of Latinx anthro anthropologists will not even look at anthropology as a space they, because they will not need to because there's so many other exciting spaces. In fact, at NYU there's more anthropologists that are higher, not in anthropology, cultural and communications, in American studies, everywhere else. In fact, all the anthropologists of color are not in anthropology. So, you know, why should we invest in anthropology, right? So anthropology has to make it, has to change and has to like, hey, court us back, because if not, it's gonna remain a white dominant space and it's gonna be less sexy to go there. <laughs> How are you gonna attract faculty people to work there when they can work with? And, and that's the other thing that I found in, in recruitment is students of color wanna work with faculty that also represents them too, right? So, and they wanna take classes, you know, in, 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 in African-American studies, in black feminisms, and those courses are not being taught in anthropology, so they're gonna go elsewhere. Mm -hmm. So I think that really anthropology needs to pay attention. And if, they, if, we, if we wanna to continue to be relevant in the 21st century, It'll, has to, it'll have to change. And I, I hope my words for what it's worth um, resonate with, with other people out there. Um, so I'm glad that there's anthropologists here in this, in this conversation. Well, I would love to just keep talking, to be honest. I, I really would. I, but I think we are over time um, for, our, for our scheduled time, which is fine. We're, we're okay if, if there's anything else you wanted to add. We also, I think, have gotten through most of the questions. Um, and, um, so I think we should call that a day and I'm sorry that the way zoom ends, it just sort of ends. And, and I know, but you know what I want to do very, very quickly. I just want to acknowledge that there's some great people in the, um, uh, let me see if I recognized, um, there is, um, um, Suad, uh, Suad, uh, Abdul Kabir, who, I know um, William Orchard, um, Muriel Hasburn, 
uh, Michael Brown, um, Maria Garcia, Lindsay Archuleta, and uh, finally, 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 um, I think Nicole Calderon, who just logged off, uh, people I know and um, are doing such exciting things. So I just wanted to thank them personally for showing up today and also for everyone who's out there. And also, um, I'm so excited to hear about that uh, artist program. You and I have to talk. Absolutely. Um, please I come visit the next time you're traveling through near the Southwest. Please come to Santa Fe um, and we would I'll give you a tour and and please tell your students about our programs because this Latinx initiative that that the Mellon Foundation is funding is uh, open to all um, graduate students and um, junior faculty and it's we have these two fellowships every year for people to come and write their dissertation or to write a book it's write up only because we're a little institution we don't have a research library so it's not a research fellowship it's a writing fellowship but we have a lovely campus so please come visit and uh, please send us your students <laughs> so thank you so much uh, professor davila and we will log off now thank you okay.